Hi, and welcome to Rule of Carnage. Uh, my name is Glenn Ford. I'm a games designer and developer, uh, having worked with uh, the chap I'm about to introduce in a second on games like Gas Sands and the Billion Suns. And that chap is Mike Hutchinson. Hello, I'm Mike Hutchinson. I've designed such games as Gaslands and A Billion Suns, uh, and we're here to talk to you about designing better miniature games, um, which is something that we talk about a lot anyway all the time. So uh, if you have seen any of the previous videos, you'll know that we record some of our uh, rambling conversations about games design, um, and we will get rambly and or opinionated on a new topic today. Glenn, what are we going to talk about? Um, so today we're going to talk a bit about uh, list building, mm. um, whether you call it uh, faction generation, um, creating uh, a, an army list or, or uh, some sort of set of models and statistics to play your game with. Um, and the first sort of conversation, we're going to talk a bit about list building, uh, list building games, why you might want to put list building into your game and what the pros and cons of it are. And then in the second half also, of the conversation... Also referred to uh, around my parts as armchair wargaming. Yes, yes. And I think, and we'll get into this, I think that's one of the main pros of list building within a game is that it, it, it makes your game into a solo playable war game in many mm. ways. <laughs> a lot of solo fun with them. Even if you um, weren't hobbying, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the, in the second half of the conversation, we're going to talk about uh, metas. Um, which is a sort of a, a, a slightly jargony term, but we'll get a bit into that. Um, explain what a meta is and talk about how metas might work in your game, how you might play with them, how they might evolve. Mm. Um, so for the first half of this conversation, I'm going to uh, take a second to, to, to sort of parenthesis out. Um, I've, uh, I was watching another, actually listening to another podcast series on how to design miniatures games. And episode one, talked about list building cracked in as the, this is the sort of because the funny thing about list building is that in the chronology of how a player approaches the game is one of the first things you do before you play a game and i've come across a few designers where they get a very rough framework of the game and then they launch into the list building because frankly it's quite a lot of fun writing factions and lists and things mm. um what i would say is although it's maybe chronologically an early thing approached by a player and maybe it's a fun thing to go to i would suggest it's not something you approach in designing your game until frankly quite late on in the process yeah i think it's um, pretty much yeah i quite often sketch out very fragmented early sketches of it in order to get the game to the table but optimizing the list building or the faction system, uh, yeah, it's almost the last thing I do once every other part of the game is stable. Yeah, yeah, I think I think it's the you need the engine personally. I think you need the engine running to understand how one list is going to work, even even at all before getting it to the tabletop. Because mm. you you're never going to really understand all the ramifications of the list you write until you get it on the table. But you need to have some idea of how it's going to clicking with what you've already created it's also it's also play. worth saying that i quite often write one faction or one army list and then play it against itself and we'll get into some more discussions about mike's obsession with generic army lists but i think it might just be that like that's a natural place to start your design if you're trying to figure out whether you know initiative and movement and shooting and combat works then um making sure that everybody's got exactly the same figures removes that as the source hmm. of any discomfort or problem in your system yeah, I mean, I, I would argue that, you know, put the system together and make sure it's fun and interesting when everybody has all the same stat lines and yeah. all the same equipment, all the same stuff. Because if, if it's boring until you dump on the faction system, it's probably not going to be that great of a game, you know, because factions are you know, uh, army lists or whatever, are kind of the, 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 the puppies in the fireworks factory. It's, it's not hard to make them quite exciting and, 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 and juicy, um, but they, people are going to know that there isn't a, a, a strong foundation underneath them. So well, also, I, it, think, I, think, I think in, like, <laughs> to, to get slightly technical from my kind of product, des product design point of view, like, they're a thing that keep people retained in the game after they've had a good experience and got them in like it's it's something that if the first game experience isn't 
isn't interesting or the first couple of game experiences aren't interesting just purely from the mechanics and the way the game folds out then i think you know potentially they never discover the the delighted the delightful depths of your intricate faction system because um yeah it's not the yeah. it's not the first thing that you fall in love with in many cases yeah absolutely um so uh we're saying what end is, what is parenthesis <laughs> yeah, yes and end parenthesis okay good um yeah so to, to the start of the conversation proper so i mean when we say a list build, list building, a list building game, I think the ultimate list building game is ultimately Warhammer Fantasy Battle. Um, mm. It's been it's been said before, and I think it is true: is Warhammer Fantasy Battle is first and foremost a, a list building game. Um, that is actually where most of the time is is physically put into it. That's where I think the 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 vast majority of the battles are won and lost. You know, if you take if you take a hardcore tournament list against a, 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 a fluffy, you know, softer list, there's no game to be played. The you know you you you'll just get meta crushed, and you know it, it'll it, it, the tabletop is is meaningless at that point. Um, and, and in I that think, in, know, in, in in that respect, in that respect, like, and obviously we're setting aside the hobby time here like hobby is a different thing but like in terms of gaming time like there's this bunch of as you say like solo war gaming it's an armchair gaming where you're thinking about the game you're running scenarios you're swapping things in and out you've got a calculator and a pencil or you've got an army building program and you are playing the game sort of in a in a weird way um through and in in some regards i, I find it quite similar to um you know a card game like magic the gathering or something where you're allowed to construct your own deck where yeah. a colossal amount of time is spent switching things in and out umming and ahhing about the stuff and the same thing occurs which is if i go you know if i if i go to play netrunner for example and i've just crammed together a deck from bits and bobs and i play somebody who's playing you know a deck that they've worked really hard on or have got from somewhere uh, from the top tier tournament or something like it's just going to be a totally one way game and there's not going to be any 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 there's not gonna be any game there yeah so um i think the first one of the first question is you know why why does list building uh exist within games to to, to the degree that they do because i would i would suggest that the vast majority of skirmish games you come across can have some degree of list building um i think it's it's interesting one inquisitor <laughs> <laughs> um i Warhammer Fantasy Battle is interesting in that because of it, because it's a list building game, it's an incredibly, it's been an, it was an incredibly modular um, product line for Games Workshop. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they could, they could bring out a book every X many months and keep that game sort of continue. And, and the similar when you say to Magic the Gathering is they can bring out blocks of, you know, releases. new options. Yeah, you know, per perpetually. Um, mm. And I think, you know, possibly on that side of um, it being a product thing, list building, you know, when your game gets to a certain level, allows it to be sort of a continuous and modular uh, progression of releases, which, you know, from the player perspective, means that you've got a, a relatively small core engine but an almost infinite array of choices the the balance is is sort of is is ideally locked into that core engine but there's something to come back to again and again and again and again you can mm. you know you can keep not just picking up the new modules but then facing the new modules you know with with what you've already got and so even if you're not keeping up with the releases hopefully it keeps the game um exciting and live for you as the if the meta changes around you it's still then interesting for you because you've got to find out how your thing reacts to the to the incoming uh wave of, of releasing now, elements now obviously and I, I you know if you're listening to this podcast and you're designing a game i assume you like me are operating in you know an indie way where that you don't have a big sort of production line behind you and so i guess the the, the other way that this like the reason that I find it important from the designs that we've been working on is that it does um, it does provide those different options and those different corners that you can go into. And then there's a question of like how you 
how you replicate that evolving meta, which we'll get into later. But I think that, like, and this is not a very Fordian uh, perspective, this is more of a Hutchonian. Um, <laughs> like the, one of the reasons that I find list building such an essential element of uh, even skirmish games is that they are triggers for new hobby loops. So mm -hmm. in the Gaslands community, people will say, okay, I'm going to do a Rutherford team. And they spend a couple of weeks thinking about a Rutherford team and building and painting and playing a few games and honing their list. And they're like, great, now I've done a Rutherford team. I'm going to do a Miyazaki team. And they get new cars and, they, and, like, and, it, and it triggers the cycle. And one of the key reasons for having um, a bunch of extra factions in the Gaslands refueled was not only was there, you know, design space still to explore, but it just gave people like, you know, 10 12 runs around the hobby loop um versus mm. the the six that they'd got in the first and that for me is uh, as a designer as as somebody who wants their game to be played multiple times enough that they will people will then tell other people uh, and enjoy it like i do think having enough sort of seats to sit in to view the performance from and wanting to explore all of mm. those seats is 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 critical and and hobby mm. is one of the loops that does that yeah, I mean, uh, so my perspective on the the upside list building is, I think that there are three main pros to to to, to list to pre building lists. Mm. Uh, the first one is, I think we've alluded alluded to just a minute ago, is it basically allows your game to to be a solo playable experience. Um, it allow if you have a game like I don't know, let's say Malifaux, to a degree of billion sums you have to have another person around the tabletop to do any playing of that game at all, to get any game out of it whatsoever. Mm. Um, something like uh, Warhammer Fantasy Battle, something like Gaslands, you can do a lot of play. A lot of the things you get out of playing, you can do totally on your own. It makes, yep. it, it, it makes your game a, a, a one plus player count, which, it, you know, it, it is genuinely, you know, uh, worth doing. It, 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 I know people who buy plenty of army books and, and games that they know nobody else is going to play and they just don't care because they're, they're interested to look through it and play around with the, the list building, the options, basically on their own. Mm. Um, I think the second thing that it does, uh, that I think does not forget investigated, is that by allowing you to prep out an army uh, or a list and know what you want to do with it, create a, a piloting guide, saves a lot of early analysis paralysis in games funnily enough because a lot of the time um in large games before anything's really started landing if you're just given an army and you put it on the table knowing what to do on the first turn is genuinely really hard and often you'll see people who like uh, um conventions i'll i'll run a, a a game with people and on the first turn they'll just go well i'll just do this to see what happens I'll, mm. I'll just move forward i'll just shoot this thing i don't know what i'm doing i'll just do what what phase is it is the movement phase all right i'll move forward to that and if you've got an army list that has certain goals certain intentions it, it makes that first rather aimless floaty turn a, a lot quicker and a lot more concrete because people can go right i know what my army needs to do it needs to get that guy over there and that guy over there he needs to get this spell pre-cast onto that unit before it gets hit by somebody and, and I, so I think that's one of the strengths of um pre-building a list is it gives something something con something concrete to bite into before the the and models start falling do you think that that's a benefit because the players feel more excited and engaged or do you think that's a benefit because like it speeds up play and it means that there's less wasted minutes i i think both those things mm. i think that having a player when you've got a list and you want to see it start humming you're like oh i can't wait to get this new list going it's going to be so badass it does this thing that combos with that thing and then he'll go because you know, another it's, it's, it's interesting because another way of solving that design challenge of people not really knowing what to do initially is to provide like the way that Gaslands does this is it says in the race scenario, like drive in that direction towards that gate. Like it doesn't matter what any of your stuff does. If you're heading in that direction, you're probably doing the right thing. So I think there's a, there's, there's a, you know, maybe that's, maybe that's more true in skirmish games, but I think there's, there's additional ways to think about that uh, challenge. 
No, 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 do, to, totally. And if you've got a set of objectives, um, that's another way of telling somebody what, what the story is they're going to achieve. And I think games like Malifaux, it's, especially because they give you the sort of open at the table list building, they give you a quite involved set of objectives to save you that sort of, I, I, don't, I don't know, there's too many options, I don't know what to do. And I think it's why uh, A Billion Sons needs quite an involved uh, an intricate um, objective system, because otherwise you would just sit there on turn one, just going, I've got all the options. I don't know what, what to do. Tell me what the, I'm doing. The object- yeah, yeah. yeah, the objective system says, okay, you're doing this and you're doing that and you're doing this and doing that. It closes down your decision space. Now you need to find the tool that, that fits into that gap. And, that, and that's so, why that... And, and, and maybe maybe this is the wrong place for this, but like there is a relationship between the, the, the scenarios, the breadth of the scenarios and... The list building challenge um mm. and so in gaslands like you will often find us uh online where people are saying like i found a thing that breaks the game this is brilliant and we'll go well that might be brilliant in scenario x but if you read the rules it says build your list then roll the scenario up so you know your one trick pony might kind of r- be rubbish if you roll up the wrong scenario which mm. um you know pati- you know particularly the way that I've played fantasy battle in the past was more like, well, it was always going to be the unending planes of doom. So if, if you, if you build a list, you know, you're going to be playing the unending planes of doom. And so, um, you know, you won't, you won't be the list building system that they have to provide is that much more complicated because it has to contain all of the challenge. Um, whereas Mm -hmm. gaslands, um, could perhaps sort of, take some of that it didn't have to be completely like what's the word i'm looking for it didn't have to completely solve the entire problem or give you an incredible surface area because you could always say like well that might be good here but it's not going to be good there yeah yeah in so far as if you if you say to people you've got to randomly select from a set of scenarios that start your game i don't necessarily need to make sure that absolutely everything is balanced in one of those scenarios because mm you should only be playing that scenario a sixth of the time. Mm. And if that thing is like over-costed in every other scenario, but under-costed in this scenario, that is balance. You know, that mm. is that is a form of balance. But if you play the, the right way, if you play six games with that same list against the same person, you know, randomly selecting the scenarios, and you go, well, I got absolutely pantsed in five of the scenarios, but that other one where I had my uber duber of wubadoo I crushed them. It's like, well, yeah, I mean, good for you. You won one out of six. That's that's what we wrote it to do, you know. Mm. Um, I'd say, and I think the third thing about um, list building, and I, I don't know if you have a comment on this because I think we've sort of spoken about it a few times before in design, is that when you have a list that has um, combo combinations and interactions available in it to find, and a play, and, and you as a player realize that you've found the the sort of the optimal uh version of a particular list it makes you feel clever you know Mm. and you know game it's it's good when a game makes you feel clever and it's good when a game makes you feel powerful um and you know having a having a well-constructed faction system a well-constructed list system where there are combinations that are rewarding without being overpowered gives you another place where you can make a player feel have a moment of feeling clever, a feeling that they've that they sort of done something, and I think, and I think we, me and Mike, have had conversations here because there is a tricky thing with hiding things within the the list system, and it's like, oh, this is the this is the breadcrumb trail you're meant to follow down to the actual way that you're meant to play this list, which you know, I I you've before expressed distaste for the idea. Well, no, 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 no. I mean. The, this is one of the most fascinating things um, uh, for me about working together is that um, I am uh, I am not a I am not a a consumer of puzzles or a solver of puzzles, um, and in some regards, what you're describing there is littering the system with puzzles and saying, look, mm-hmm. if you just if you just follow the clues and you you tabulate if you tabulate the stuff correctly and you follow the logic, you will find that there is this tasty treat buried under here. And players like me will just go smashy, smashy. Oh, that didn't work. I wonder why. Let's just smash something else. Um, and from a games design point of view, I'm you know I'm much more focused on like 
the elegance of the evocation of the theme through the mechanics and that alchemy that we've talked about before. And I just don't quite have the brain for it. So I suppose in terms of this, like, does your does your game does your game need a list building element? Like, how do you do that list building element? Great. I think in some regards, like I came to the realization through um, designing uh, the last few games that I actually don't have a particularly keen eye for this. And one of the reasons that I might have been bad at a game like Fantasy Battle is that I didn't have a keen eye as a player, and so I don't have a keen eye as a designer. So I suppose if you are the kind of person who loves finding and solving the puzzles in army lists um like maybe you should lean harder into this as a design element and and place puzzles and be like no no i'm gonna actually deliberately focus on that as a as a fun thing um because Mm -hmm. you know because maybe you have you have a skill there that you can you can you can gift something to the players i mean i think certainly whether or not you intentionally build in a perfect structure as you're writing the list if you're if you're going to play test, eventually some lists will fall out in your play testing. Mm. They're going to be sort of stronger and weaker. And we're not going to talk about balance today. That's a conversation for for another time. But the, there is going to be a point where you have to make that decision as to am I going to balance everything out against everything else, or am I going to say, yeah, you know what, some of the lists are more powerful, um, and finding which of those lists are is one of the 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 sweet is that are buried in my game it's one of the we're going to say it's one of the heuristics to playing it or it's or it's the the process of learning the game or it's just purely yeah this is one of the fun moments you'll try out a bunch of lists and whether it's through monkeys on typewriters or through examining a puzzle eventually you'll hit a list that's more powerful than the others and you'll go ha ah, i found one of the ones that's more powerful than the others good on me i you know i'm gonna feel that i've achieved the next level of play in this game and it is worth having levels of play for, for gamers to get to yeah and then, um, and then there's a problem which we will talk about in the next half of the conversation which is once one person finds that and solves it thanks to the internet lots of other people will find that out and that can be a problem for people or it can be a thing that you design around and we'll talk about that later i guess um oh, sorry you were about to launch into another i was i mean i was about to move on to some of the possible cons of of putting a significant level of list building into your game. Yep. Um, and I think, I mean, the first one of those is you can end up creating a fairly significant barrier to entry uh, yep. for your players. If your game doesn't have uh, a list building and it has a set of, you know, preset units or whatever it happens to be, you, you can pick and play. If you've got to sit down and write a list before you start playing, then you've got to sit down and you've got to read the entire, everybody has to read the entire rule book. If you get to something like Whammer Fantasy Battle, everybody's got to read several rule books before they start playing. You know, mm-hmm. I've got to read the main rule book and I've got to read my, you know, faction rule book, my army list, my codex, whatever it happens to be. And ideally, I need to have read your army list or codex, whatever it is, in order to get a good game out of it. And mm-hmm. that means I've got to read all of the army lists and codexes if I'm just turning up to a pickup game. Um, Mm. And I think one of the things, again, like going to conventions and running things like Gaslands um, to to people who are from a more board game perspective is board gamers, for example, bulk at like a 10 page rule book. And then you go with a tabletop miniatures game. It's like, okay, you've got to read this rule book and then you've got to read these rule books and you've got to read uh, these rule books and then you'll be mid-level competitive probably. But actually, just just to follow that board game comparison, though, I suppose, like, it, for me, it's quite interesting that, like, army list variations from historical wargaming, like, they exist because, you know, they hadn't manufactured that tank yet, and so you're not allowed to mm. take it in this thing. Or, like, the Persians had something different, like, they had a different makeup of troops. Whereas quite a lot of the skirmish games that I write and play treat the army list variation much more like factions in a board game where the purpose of the factions is well this is going to emphasize this strategy this is going to emphasize this other strategy this is going to be a blend of the two and in some regards like designing an army list system in a tabletop wargaming like you're likely not going there is a tendency i think to sleepwalk into where there are variations simply because i think that lizard men probably didn't have this weapon and so i'm not going to put it into my which i think is a much less interesting um approach than the sort of almost the more board game approach which is okay what am i going to emphasize as a strategy in here or de-emphasize as a strategy in this other list 
Yeah, I mean, and and again, this is possibly a sort of side um, sidebar conversation. It is interesting that, let's say, in in fantasy games, if I say that there's a dwarf army and an elf army, it's probably a list of qualities you can attach to both of those armies in your head immediately, mm-hmm. um, and a, and a goblin army, and and it's like, okay, I know that the goblin army is going to, you know rush with numbers at the other army i know the dwarf army is and probably break easily gonna, yeah and the dwarf army is probably not going to move around an enormous amount it's probably got some sort of heavy machinery of devastation i imagine the elf army is going to be small and elite it's when you're if you're writing your lists to um cre- to, to to create interesting face-offs of Okay, this army is going to emphasize these qualities and these armies are going to emphasize those qualities. Do educate yourself, I think, about what every other system has done and what the face-offs are. And why... not, not, every, not every other system, but yeah. Well, a, 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 a good selection of other systems. Okay. Um, I, am, I, I am actually right in the middle of a massive pile uh, of like, because I'm writing, I'm, I'm, I'm working on Hobgoblin at the moment. That's what's got my go. And so I literally have a pile that's like Kings of War, Gods of Battle, Oathmark, um, uh, 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 Warhammer Apocalypse, Horizon Wars, um, going through all these different games, trying to like, exactly as you say, like analyze what, what's going on in those other systems. Because in some regards, like it's a double-edged sword because like the reason some of those tropes exist is because of Tolkien, because of like genre fiction, because of the things that we naturally associate with those in, in film and literature. And that's mm. good. That's a shorthand that reduces the mental load on the players. They turn up like, okay, elves, cool. Got it. Right. I know to, I know to like hold, hold steady and expect them to try and run around the flanks and what, and shoot me and stuff. Mm. But um, it's also an opportunity to disrupt that and be like, no, no, actually it's, you know, there's a different challenge here. And I guess that's actually, that's a proper question. Like, the, mm. the the con the con of disrupting players' expectations just because you could like was that worth the energy was that worth the mental load? Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. I would say don't don't do a, a game where the goblins are elves and the elves are goblins and the dwarves are humans and the humans are dwarves. But consider the you know the possibilities of why it is that the various that there are the set tropes of army lists why they work in the way that they work and consider different ways in 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 playing around with them um you know why why is an army that just rushes with numbers such a standardized trope in in wargaming um and how you might choose to try and do that differently and how you might how you might build your way out of that problem um, I think one of the another con uh, to list building, um, and it's something that I do think be, could could be very present. It's something again we alluded to earlier um, with one of fantasy battle is the lost before you arrive at the tabletop situation. Mm-hmm. Um, there's nothing more dispiriting, um, I think, as a player than turning up at a tabletop and suddenly realizing before you roll dice one how outclassed you are. Um, I'm, ch- and- I'm chuckling because this isn't always just a problem of list building. This can't just be the quality <laughs> of the player. I mean, yeah, but uh, usually you find that out halfway through turn two, at the yeah, very least. Yeah. And, it's, and, it's, and it's particularly dispiriting. It, funnily enough... Why are your Chaos that- Warriors still stuck behind those beastmen, Mike? What are they doing there? They're not. That's like, that's like a third of your army. What is he doing there? <laughs> I, th- I thought you had a plan. Why did you, like, I assumed you put them behind them because you were going to do a thing. And now we're halfway through the game and they're still just sitting there. I don't Spinning even need to <laughs> I just I'm gonna leave them to their own business. They're just a point sink. What do you think? Yeah. Um, uh, funnily enough, it's like if you're that outclassed, you pro- might not even know it. It's when you know full well that you've taken a fluffy, right. silly, fun list to what you thought was a, a fun thing, and you see something else hit the table on the other side of you, and you realise this is somebody who hopefully to give them credit is like practicing for a tournament and that's why they're bringing it to a club mm. pickup game and then you just look across the table and go oh oh god no i don't want i know that i've not bought a list to 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 play against this machine i know what i know what it does i can even tell you what your you know what your piloting is going to yeah. be shall i i tell you shall i go oh. back around the table and do your your turn for you because i know what you're going to do and i know oh. you're going to slaughter me you know um mm. yeah 
yeah, that that can, that that can be an issue. Um, and is that I, is that so? I guess an interesting question is: is that the mark of a effective list building system that that scenario that disparate disparation can exist like is that a good faction system or is that a bad is that a design problem that needs resolving because i can kind of see arguments both ways like if, if you can't design a, a list so sharp that you can literally cut onions with it then is there really an interesting enough challenge there or is that or rather I mean, is that the epitome of a challenge i i think i mean you, you you've talked about the social convention of, of playing war games and uh, you know i think Hopefully, if you've got a game with enough depth and weight, it's going to have distinctly different sort of categories of play. Mm. And I think part, you know, an important part of the social convention is hopefully players knowing that I know what a tournament list is in Warhammer, Warhammer Fantasy Battle, and I won't bring it to a friendly club night because mm. it's it's just it's no fun for me and it's no fun for the other person. Um, and yeah, I mean, hopefully, it, hopefully, it's a sign of the richness of your game if there can be that disparity from one list. To right, another. and then and then it, and then, as you say, it's on the players to resolve that situation. That's not a design issue with your game. That's a that's a social contracting issue. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Hopefully, if they've written a, a sort of laser sharp tournament list, they know it's a laser sharp tournament list, and they know. The, the, the problem is the player who knows they've created a laser sharp tournament list and knows that they're taking it to a, a fun, relaxed, casual club night and knows that they're going to just end up spending the evening kicking through pudding and being entirely happy that, that that's the situation. But yeah, I, I personally, I, I, I think that where that, that is a, a problem when it, when it occurs because of the depth and weight of, uh, and breadth of your game, it's a social problem. When it occurs because the army lists are just a bit poorly written, that's your problem. Um, if, it, if it occurs with relatively few options and some lists are just, there's just no way you can make a certain list competitive and nothing in the, the game tells you, oh, this is just a silly list, you know, and then you take it to the tabletop and it turns out that you just get pantsed um, because the other person just took the obvious choices on their own list and didn't know and had no way of knowing that they were bringing uh, a, a far more powerful list than you. That's, I think, when it when it's going to start running into problems and it's going to make things unfun for both people. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So we, you talked about the you talked about the cons there. So what? So I guess the question is, like, when when would you not have an army designing or forced sort of list building thing in your game? And you know, what would you have instead? Because I think actually, when you look across the games on our shelves, a huge proportion of them do have a list building element in them mm. um well, i think that and i think the last con and the biggest con and again it's one that i think referred to earlier is mm. that list building reduces the value of the tabletop play and i think it's something that's become um and you know and i, I, do, I do think it's worth sort of dipping our toes into this part of the conversation here it's become something that's become more and more significant with the internet and with net lists and the availability of just picking up a, a, a top play tournament list and a piloting guide and, and, and just, just using that, knowing almost zero about the game and turning up with an incredibly finely honed and brutal list and then playing it by somebody else's set of instructions. So the other person's basically not playing you, they're playing, you know, one of the top tier tournament players in the world. Um, and the value to not having list building in your game, um, the value of it in something like A Billion Sons uh, and Malifaux, is that, that if that can happen, it's incredibly hard to, 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 to be able to, to just give somebody a, a cheat sheet for those games. Mm. Um, it means that they're games that have to be played at the tabletop. They have to be engaged with in the present. There's no chance you're going to end up playing some 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 guy on a forum you know a million miles away who's built the perfect list that, that's essentially foolproof you know you're going to be playing the the person sat across the table from you um and the interaction is therefore going to be going to be real and it's all going to happen there in front of you and it's not going to be who did the most homework and it's not going to be who has the best google foo to find the most up-to-date killer list um, and I think this is we we talked about this you know a, a fair bit during the 
billion suns design process but i think this is another place where like m making callbacks to board game faction systems is or, or board games is is useful because like I, I can't think of a board game off the top of my head i'm sure there is one where you design your playing pieces before you come to the beginning of that game like you pick the meeples that you need or you design your you know there's, pro there's probably some dungeon crawlers where that's that's maybe not true but in general like you come to the table with some known set of resources whether they're whether they're symmetrical or asymmetrical and then it's all about that table play and it's all about what happens at the table and, and and how you spot the opportunities and how you play those play those odds or play those um kind of strategies out and yeah and i think that that's like by removing as you say by removing the the list building thing you kind of end up with that question of like is this interesting every time is there a you know is there a set of is there a set of player kind of conversations and player sort of puzzles that they're setting for each other which are interesting each time yeah and i, and I think i think that's it, what it boils down to i think in broad brush strokes is that the the pros to having a level of this building is it gives your game an off the tabletop depth mm. and the value to that is that it, it gives your players you know ways to tear themselves out and you know, uh, can save you from grognard capture and, and, and problems like that to some degree. Um, but the problem with it is that with the, the modern world being the fact that everybody can access everybody else's opinions all the time, is that that depth can get processed very, very quickly by the, the, the world hive mind. Um, and everybody can end up playing a very thin level very very swiftly um and if you don't happen to be on that level you you just have an unfun time and so if your game's depth is based around those lists and those lists have been razor sharp out by the availability of minds that the internet provides you that depth has just disappeared and if your game doesn't have those lists you know, you don't have that depth. You don't have that. Oh, I can go and play it for fifteen hours at home and uh, and construct all these lists and have all that fun. And you don't have that potential for tearing out. But you also don't have that potential for it razor blading out. You know, through uh, through the artificial widening of your meta pool that the internet provides. You and it means that the design problems you chose to answer while you were designing are the design problems your players are going to face. Whereas sometimes when you're list building, the design problems you're expecting them to face, they're just not going to face because somebody's going to have done that work for them. Mm, and just they, elim eliminated that question already. Yeah. And if that original, the point we made way back at the start of the conversation, which is write your game so it's interesting if everybody just has the same forces. If your game's not interesting, if some if everybody has, has completely identical forces, and net lists basically razor out your list building to the point where everyone essentially has identical forces. Your game's going to be boring again. Um, you know, the, the, yeah. I guess the only other, the only other, just little dusty corner that I'd just like to blow the cobwebs out of momentarily is that you know we we've both played a fair amount of RPGs, and depending on depending on the the the, the tastes of the system some rpgs can provide quite a lot of randomness in the build of your party or the build of your character and i don't know that there are too many examples i've seen one or two recently um but i don't think there are too many examples of uh, miniature games attempting to give people random forces or or, or shake up like shake up the force construction because that would be another way of getting people to the table really fast would be you know you either give them a preset list or there's only a very small number of options to choose from or you say okay there's a fun little moment where you like you know <clears throat> it's the classic realm of chaos book like you roll up your warband and you find out what they've got and oh that's hilarious our stuff is totally unbalanced but now we'll just have to deal with that mm. Yeah, and I, and I think we 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 have spoken it very. There was a lot of I I think sort of early GW stuff where the vast majority of you, like we say, first edition Blood Bowl, where all of your star players' abilities and qualities were randomly generated, and and your teams were you know by and large randomly generated half the time. Um, and okay, it totally destroyed any ability to cunningly put together a team in a powerful manner, but it did sometimes just completely destroy the experience for you because your star player could basically do nothing apart from fall over at the start of the match and cry about how he's wasted his life. Um, 
I, I think I think personally, um, it's more interesting to do things like preset lists, um, you know, or yeah, give give people the menu if you don't want to overwhelm them with choices. There's nothing wrong with like, okay, here are like five heroes, and and that hero does is hero that does blah blah, and he comes with his retinue, and this hero. Well, yeah, with- and 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 they revisited that in Age of Sigma with the Path to Glory stuff, where they've contained it to. A, a set of options that are they rough out at something equivalent of in fighting strength so you know you might get d6 horrors but only d3 flamers or something mm. and there's a set of yeah. things that you can choose from and I, I i i am kind of you know i'm slightly seduced by that as a as a as a place to give the players like i mean it in that situation in, in age of sigma it's simply an option that they provide which is basically like if we've just turned up and we both have some armies but or we both have some figures but and you know we've both been at work all week and we haven't really figured our our lists out i i have this all the time um because i'm you know i have a time poor lifestyle and so i will sit down to play the game and like at the moment i sit down to play the game is the moment that i'm like adding up the final numbers of how many robots i've got um and so my my list design is is very very last minute and very poorly considered um but that's just that's just the kind of player that i <laughs> i am yeah but i i think, it's, I think and so for me it would work fine in that situation to be like all right it roughs out over a few games that it's there's some randomness in it and and the payoff to that is you know near instant setup and i think there are more and more games that if they don't give you a preset like little retinue for your for your hero they give you a hero that very tightly controls what you're allowed in your retinue mm. so i think um uh Tist of honor has that to a to greater or lesser degree um uh war machine i seem to remember although it doesn't super control it gives you those sort of lists where it says oh you'll get bonuses if you take these guys and so it means that there are certain that- lists that are just automatically better and so you may as well just take those lists and there's there's a lot of offspray rule systems that are like that which is like you know you choose your faction then you just get a small very small pool of options um okay. anyhow right air writer yep so okay that's uh, been a conversation about the nature of of list building in a game why you might want to consider it in your game what some of the uh, pros and cons are possibly what some of the alternatives are we're going to sign off on this conversation. And uh, the next one, we're going to have a little chat about uh, metas, which we've repeatedly uh, thrown around as a term in this conversation alluded to. And we're going to get into a bit of a, a bit more of a dive on what it is, what it means to your game, um, what you can do about it, how you can play around with it. Um, if you've watched this far through this conversation, I assume you enjoy some part of what we're doing and, and, and why we're doing it. If you do, please like and subscribe. The, buttons are down there somewhere if you haven't enjoyed it tell us why you haven't enjoyed it tell us what you'd like rather see us talking about um suggest some games that we've horribly overlooked as in, in their brilliant solution to the list building problem um rant about why you dislike um list building or, or love list building or whatever else it happens to be i'd love to have a conversation in the comment section with you about any of those subjects uh, but for now, um, please get in touch with us through social media, drop us comments, uh, reach out to us. Uh, but for the moment on this episode of Rule of Carnage, it's going to be goodbye. Bye. Bye-bye.